Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Builders Call, first one of May. So May 2nd, Builders Call. Um, we've got a really exciting one for you today. It'll be the first one where uh, the community is giving updates. So specifically, the gateways are talking about what they've been building. Um, we have a ooh, we have a pretty light agenda because um, we're going to be hearing mostly from the different um, the different gateways themselves. So uh, we're going in order of I think what'll be like the lightest updates to the to the deepest dives. So porters first, then liquify, then nodies. That'll give um, everybody plenty of time to get their updates in. Then we'll have an open floor for any questions about the gateways themselves, or if people have other builders questions for um, for Shane or Olshansky or anybody that's building. So I'm just going to jump right into our announcements and updates. So just some housekeeping. We are doing office hours on Wednesdays, so that's from 1 to 3 Pacific or 4 to 6 Eastern. Um, I do recommend if anybody has any questions to jump in, like it's a great opportunity to, it, it feels a little more chill, like an opportunity to like talk about ideas, try to figure stuff out, or maybe ask questions that you might feel uncomfortable asking in a group like this. So the whole point is to have space um, for what might be the dumbest questions you could possibly think of. Or if you have a really cool idea and you're just trying to collect some feedback, you know, we've usually had six to 10 people in those and um, it's been really great. And not to put you on the, sh on the spot, Shane, but you are going to join me for one of them this month. Do you know which one yet? Uh, I don't. Um, I'm pretty flexible this month. So, um, yeah, I could. I, I, I'm pretty sure I could pretty much make any, any week right now. Cool. Well, then I will uh, nail that down with Shane, and then we can have an office hours where Shane's available and we can really focus on tech-related stuff. So um, this group specifically would be really awesome to have you all in there discussing ideas, things we want to build. Um, yeah, so we'll get you that update. I'll throw it into the chat so you all can um, be aware of which week. And again, that's Wednesdays from 4 to 6. Um, for those of you that have an open quick grant, so our impact is due this week. I made an announcement earlier. Um, there's a Discord channel for quick grants, which you all should have access to. And uh, I was down with COVID over the weekend, which is bleeding into this week a little bit. So I'm going to do all of my reviews on Monday. Uh, so if you don't have an update in by Monday, the automatic closure of your um, of your quick grant is going to happen. So please get it in before them or message me if something else has come up. And then Shane, do you want to do the Shannon testnet updates? Yeah, sure thing. Uh... Pretty straightforward. Um, right now, uh, they're currently doing end-to-end -end testing. Um, this is really everything all working uh, all at the same time, all together. And so, uh, yeah, this is where they are, you know, noticing what's what's working, what's having issues, um, and currently addressing them uh, in a speedy fashion. And so. Basically, public testnet, we're hoping for uh, May 7th right now. That's the official launch date that we're going with right now. Um, there's going to be a lot of materials for builders in this. Uh, there's going to be a Shannon uh, overview document, which basically lets everyone under know, uh, understand what uh, actors and what concepts are behind Shannon um, to kind of get to, to see the high level of how everything is fitting together. And then there will also be tech, uh, technical documentation and uh, builder videos for people to actually start uh, taking on different actors, including gateways, including suppliers, and start testing things. Now, with this test net, the goal is to break it. Like that's we're 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 intentionally releasing this in a let's break it uh, kind of way. We're not releasing this in a um, hey, this is all going to be working perfect. Uh, everything's all figured out, uh, and, you know, uh, start using it. This is going to be a, we're, we're specifically looking for the issues. We're specifically looking to break it. So the more that it breaks, uh, the more successful it is. So that's how we're going about it. Um, but yeah, people can start breaking it. Uh, it looks like right now, May 7th. Thanks, Shane. Um, cool. If anybody has any questions on that, there's a, a whole bunch of uh, channels in the Discord. Um, if you don't have them available, you can feel free to DM me, but um, conversations are happening in those channels or on the test net. So yeah, let us know if you're having any issues. Let's see. Uh, I guess without further ado, we're going to jump into 
We're going to jump into our first announcement, or sorry, our first update from the Porters team. Hey, Sasquatch, do you want to, I'm going to stop sharing here. Do you want to see if you can share? Um, I would love to share, except we don't have anything to share. This is going to be a, a vocal <laughs> presentation. Okay. Well, I'm going to hand it over to you then. Take it away, buddy. Right on. Thanks, man. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Sasquatch slash Ian, and I am with the Porters team. Um, we're building a gateway like the rest of the illustrious gateways that have been brought on this last little round. So we're one of the three new ones. Um, thanks again to Grove and Nodies for all their support as we got ourselves figured out. Um, and obviously the Bucket Network for their support as well. Um, so as far as an update, um, we are marching ahead towards our launch, um, or opening up the gateway. We finalized the um, app stakes portion just this week, and so should be able to start sending relays uh, in a testing fashion next week. Um, so we're we're a little bit farther behind Liquify, and um, but we're making progress. Uh, but the thing I wanted to talk to everybody about today, which is kind of our opportunity for builders with an ecosystem to engage with porters, is on top of our RPC providing, which you know we have tons of great RPC providers already. Uh, we are uh, looking to build what our tech lead plor described as the safe apps um, of code. So within our within our site, we want to offer up a place both for builders to submit their code, submit their code snippets, um, so that they can get other they can get engagement with their code um, with their SDKs. And also um, get people to, you know, expose, debug, help improve uh, that code, as well as offering up a place where builders who want to accelerate their development process come on and grab code snippets. So we're looking to embed some of the more like traditional um, code just into one place. So bringing in like the WAGME um, front end code base, but also bringing in some more unique pieces the first of which is going to be the smart invoice sdk this came from raid guild it was the evolution of the escrow service that we utilize to work with clients um locking up funds uh releasing based on milestone achievement um and providing security for projects um and so that's basically uh, what I wanted to show today. Um, again, we are, we're not quite there to where we could have a full demo for you guys. So we're not a visual, a visual gateway yet, um, but we expect to be there within the next couple of weeks. So hopefully by the next time we have a builder call, I'll be able to show off our UI and um, our swapping feature for the token that covers the relays through porters um, and some of the more sexy stuff. But for the purpose of this call, I just wanted to advertise that that's kind of, that's where we're moving towards. So builders in the ecosystem, um, soon there's gonna be a place where you can come to grab extra code, code snippets and SDKs and a place for you to post your own um, for feedback. Um, and I think I'll stop right there. And we have um, we have a couple more of the team on, online here and one of them being Plora our tech lead. And so if there's any more technical questions or you want a better explanation, um, feel free to ask it. And if I can't answer then, um, I'm sure Plora can. So thanks. Appreciate the opportunity guys. And girls. Thanks Ian. Plora, do you have anything you want to contribute? Um, no, I think uh, Sasquatch covered it pretty well. Um, yeah, happy to answer any questions if anyone has them. Well, I'll hold a beat here and see if anybody has any questions in the chat.
All right. Well, um, Sasquatch and team, where can people reach out if they have questions outside this call? Like, what's the best way to get a hold of your team? Ah, uh, good point. Let me drop in the invite link to our Discord. You can jump in, and say hi. Cool. Da, 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 da. All right. Thanks, Ian. Appreciate the update. Um, if anybody does have any questions, obviously you can still drop them in chat or bring them up in the open floor, and then uh, definitely join the Discord if you have any other thoughts. Ian, I'm looking. I'm looking forward to a, a big update in a couple of weeks when you guys are ready. Sweet. Thanks so much. All right. Yeah. Um, Andy, are you going to be presenting for Liquify today? Yeah, I can show you my screen. Nothing right. kind of formal. You know. I was just going to go through what we've got already. Awesome. All right, we can see it, I think. GitHub? So, yeah, so I was just kind of, yeah, that's what I wanted to show. So I just kind of wanted to give a, a kind of brief overview on, on what we've been doing at Liquify in terms of our gateway and what we're open sourcing to um, for gateway providers. So we've kind of built um, multiple multiple sections to our gateway operator. Um, we've got the front end, the back end. So front end for the portal. So it allows users to come in and create endpoints. You can manage endpoints, set usage limits, um, check analytics, uh, invite people to your organization where they can, again, create um, additional endpoints, um, manage, manage usage, delete endpoints, rotate keys, all that kind of nice stuff to do. So this is already live in beta. We've sent out a few invites already for people to use We've had a fair bit of traffic coming through from from beta testers around about a million two million calls per day um we will got another about 20 or 30 which we're going to onboard um probably tomorrow to, to test with so if you haven't already um sign up and you can have a play around so i kind of go into a, a bit more about what the other tools we've built around this portal gateway so we've got the api gateway which has already gone live um Again, that, that's all open sourced. You can look at that, play around with that. So that kind of um, does all API key validation. So you, to, to hit our gateway, you're calling gateway um, forward slash API with a key in it, which is a 16 character uh, key. So this, this gateway basically just checks against the um, MySQL uh, database, which gets updated from the portal backend when you generate keys, rotate keys. Uh, it then caches those keys and basically forwards that request onto a gateway server and does rate limiting analytics via Prometheus, which I haven't actually put on this um, diagram, as well as various other um, kind of quality of life uh, improvements. We can we can do retries and kind of dynamic routing and things from there um, for you know, kind of all nice things to do. And again, that that metric stream is then picked up by the portal backend, which is what is displayed in in the analytics graphs that we have on our gateway. So we've got quite a lot of code which is going to be coming to open source and kind of show you what we've got in the closed source stuff, which is coming to open source probably tomorrow. We've still got a few um, small changes to do, mostly around variables and, and M files because we've got a few hard coded stuff which we wanted to sort out. But yeah, we've been working quite hard on this the past few weeks. We've done quite a lot of commits to our um, back end and front end uh, to get us all ready for beta. So yeah, we're looking forward to opening it up to open source and kind of other developers or other community members looking at it and supporting us with with development. And that's yeah, that's kind of the high level of what we've been been looking at. Again, I forgot to mention the uh, the portal back end. Um, it's quite a comprehensive API set. Thanks, Andy. All, that's all I was going to show today. So, yeah, if there's any questions, feel free. Uh, with with your uh, with all these components, uh, yeah. uh, I I assume each one is like your back end and your front end are basically just kind of uh, independent containers. Um, Correct. Yeah. So it'll just be a Docker compose that you can just spin okay. everything up Got with. It. Yeah. Got it. 
they, those Docker images are already built. They're already hosted on our on our Docker Hub. So anyone can actually touch them at the minute if they want. Play around with them. It's just the code's not fully open source yet. And the uh, the back end, uh, I believe you 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 said was written in Python. Is that yeah. correct? Okay. Yeah. So it's a uh, Python Flask app. Uh, again, there's, like I said, there's quite a few different components, different APIs in here. Got it. And then this automatically, like these APIs, uh, I, I guess a number of them would then interface with uh, uh, Gateway Server. Is that correct? Uh, no. So this this back end is is purely to service the the front end portal as well as that API gateway. So the API gateway is what's talking directly to um, Gateway Server. Okay, got it. Got it. And then uh, so so someone would deploy Gateway Server, uh, kind of, it not not directly part of this deployment. Um, like they would deploy Gateway Server. And then, uh, uh, and then I guess put in variables and things like that in in certain areas. Is there like a config file or something where you just kind of, you know, point to your gateway server instance or anything like that? Yeah. So that's done. There's a an M file in. So you just basically update this M file. All they pass uh, in the variables into cool. the, the Docker container. Awesome, awesome. We've made it, yeah, fairly simple. I kind of want it to just be a yeah Docker deploy that you just you pass in your environment variables and it should sort everything else for you. Andy, there's a question in chat. Are you able to see that? Uh, yes. Uh, my 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 discourse kind of crashed as I was reading it. <laughs> Could you read it out to me? Would love to. <laughs> uh, Takadashi is asking if Liquify is Liquify soloing siloing the current IaaS and Pocket services, i.e., current IaaS services don't back up to Pocket, and Pocket Gateway won't back up your current services. Curious about hybrid solutions. Yeah, so we would. So I, I, if I understood this question correctly, it's it's kind of are we going to pass to our existing infrastructure or pocket services, and how we're dealing with that hybrid solution? I guess that's is that is that right, Pocketashi? Yeah. So so currently the 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 gateway beta that we've deployed is is solely going through Pocket. Um, none of it's touching our uh, our centralized infrastructure. And then we're also passing some of our existing traffic from clients um, to, to Gateway Server. We've got a inside that um, API gateway that I've got there. I don't know if I've pushed this release yet, but it's kind of got a hybrid um, routing built into that. So it can check latency based. So it can route traffic that we've got um, either to Pocket or to us, depending on, on which gives best latency as well as retries. We can have it retrying to us. Uh, kind of like an uh, like an altruist kind of routing, but currently everything's going through um, Pocket Network via that gateway. Thanks, Andy. Does anybody else have any other questions? Anybody want to drop anything in the chat? Yeah, one one more question with uh, uh, with your current running of Gateway Server. Um, did you dial in uh, kind of specific QoS, um, you know, variables? Uh, or because with with QoS and Gateway Server, you know, you can set different variables on, uh, you know, how uh, uh, you know how frequently the test happens and all that kind of jazz. Uh, did you kind of dial it in? Have you been dialing in those, or have you kind of been operating off of a, uh, you know, a uh, uh, kind of a default uh, default one, and it's been working fine for you. How, how's that experience been? 
Yeah, cu currently we, we've just been using the default ones. The, uh, a couple of variables we changed with mostly around timeouts. We noticed we were having a few timeouts on Solana, mostly, because um, I think it was five seconds by default. So we played around with that. Um, we've also uh, I've more or less finished the, the coding now to add near support for the quality of service checking. Um, so that, that should go live probably next week, once I've done a bit more testing on that. Or it'll be live for a PR next week. But yeah, it, it just works. I think I've got my chat back, like Blade says. Great. Um, thank you so much, Andy. Appreciate the, the update. We're looking forward to that going open. I want to make an announcement on the right space. Uh, if, if, oh, sorry, go on. You're breaking up a little bit on my side. I don't know if that's just me. Uh, I was just saying, yeah, if uh, if anyone wants to test the, the beta, yeah, make sure they sign up. I'll be sending out some more invites tomorrow. Cool. I'm going to drop the link to the Gateways channel, um, announcement channel there. Uh, if you don't already follow that, make sure you turn that on. And then, um, Andy, it'd be great for you to put an announcement there when it's ready. I will do. I'll sort that now. Cool. Thanks, Andy. All right, Blade. You ready, bud? Yeah. Let me see here. Can you hear me fine? Sound great. Cool. One sec. Andy, there is one more question for you in the chat if you want to respond to that. You can do it text or open the mic if you want. I don't think I see that question. Who was it from? Uh, Dashi says, have current clients expressed interest in purely routing to pocket or are most interested in hybrid? Most of them are kind of the hybrid. They want the highest uptime and, and also the lowest latency. So we've had a few people who were interested in more of a decentralized approach, but they still wanted that kind of backup of a, of a hybrid solution. Sweet. Um, let's see here. Can you see my screen, Zach? Yeah, it looks great. Fantastic. Just a heads up, you are sharing it like high resolution, so you might break up a little unless you have really good internet. Uh, good point. Let me change it. You guys now get 1080p and 30 frames per second. It's all we deserve. <laughs> all right, cool. Hey everyone, um, interesting enough. I know that you know we went over a couple of the gateway updates, which is great. Um, and today we're going to be going over kind of you know why the gateway server, what is the gateway server, and uh, going more deeper into kind of like a, a technical perspective of how the gateway server works under the hood and the various things that is taken care of for you. Um, but before we kind of go into that, I do want to talk about like why we developed the gateway server in the first place and why it's useful. And so kind of going into kind of like the problem statement here is that uh, Pocket can really only be leveraged by those who are well informed about the protocol. Uh, not saying that it can't be used by others, but, um, you know, really, when you whatever you really think about it, uh, there's just so much things that happens within a protocol, right? Um, it's not as simple as tapping into a simple HTTP endpoint because Pocket is a blockchain. And so you have to think about things like grabbing a session, uh, signing a relay and providing a proof for it, and then as well, like hashing your relay and then send that to a network. It's not intuitive. It's uh, really, unless you spend a lot of time studying about the protocol, uh, it will take you some time to actually send a request over to the network. And we wanted to make that easier for people to use. And so, you know, also just kind of looking at like the existing solutions right now and kind of like simplifying that and reducing the frictions that you could use the pocket sdk there's pocket go there's pocket js and you know there's pros and cons to it uh, one of the pros is that you don't have to go through a uh, gateway at all you don't have to go through grove you don't have to go through nodes you could just directly use the pocket sdk and go directly into the protocol uh, the problem with that is you know uh, it, it requires 
for you to still write some code as a developer. And so like, you know, thinking like from a persona, let's just say I'm a blockchain exchange and I want to grab the latest Ethereum block. Uh, most people would just use like web, web 3 JS, web 3 Python library, plug in an inferior endpoint and that's it. Whenever you use the pocket SDK, you know, given that it's a blockchain, it's not that intuitive. And so you would have to write some, you would have to import the pocket SDKs, write some custom code, and still it would take you some time to actually get integrated with pocket. Um, and so, you know, we didn't really see that being adopted, but as well, given that uh, apps are permission right now, it's not really an option, but hopefully in Shannon, it will be an option. Um, and then the other way is through the gateway approach. Uh, pros of that is you get an easy endpoint. You go to Grove, you go to Nodes, you go to Liquify, Porters, and you just grab an endpoint. Cons of that is it's a little bit more centralized because you're still technically going through a centralized entity. Uh, and at the time, whenever the gateway server wasn't developed, uh, there was only one gateway at the time, which was Grove, right? And so it wasn't ideal. And ultimately, that's kind of led us into combining kind of like the pros and cons of both using the SDK and going through a singular gateway to develop the pocket gateway server. Uh, effectively, this is what allows us to grow into multiple gateways and uh, potentially even light gateways. And I'll go into that in a little bit. So yeah, what is the, actually the gateway server? Um, it's a lightweight web server that abstracts away the, the complexities of the protocol. And as well, it adds on a lot of enhancements to the protocol as well, such as quality of service checks, it provides you this, you know, simple HTTP endpoint that you could use uh, to send a request over to the network. Um, and so it provides a very development friendly user interface uh, and tooling that you could use to send over a request to the network. Uh, kind of going into kind of like the use cases of the gateway server. Uh, we already touched on this, but B2B uh, gateway servers, sorry, gateways under the hood can use the gateway server and they are using the gateway server under the hood. Uh, as far as I know, Nodes, Liquify, mm -hmm. Porters, and future gateway operators are going to be using the gateway server under the hood. And right now, like dApps, you know, startups, just like people who just want to connect to the blockchain, uh, they can't use the gateway server because, you know, apps are permission. However, in the Shannon update, I also envision that, you know, these small developers, instead of syncing up uh, a full blockchain state, you know, trying to load up a full Ethereum node that takes 600 gigabytes, terabytes of data, they could literally just stake in an application in Shannon and spin up the gateway server and boom, right off the bat, you have access to the Ethereum chain and 50 other chains that you could tap into. And that's extremely powerful. And so uh, let's go into a little bit more of kind of like the steps it currently takes to um, send a relay to the network. It's honestly really complex. A lot of these terminologies are specific to Pocket. And that's why I say that without using the SDK or without using a gateway or using the gateway server, uh, it really it's really tough to kind of tap into the network right uh aats is something that most developers wouldn't know about and all these steps from two to six you know like dispatching and retrieving a session um, unless you're very familiar with pocket terminology these are things that aren't really easily consumable especially if you're just used to a, a endpoint right um, and so that's what the gateway server under the hood kind of abstracts away from you as well. Um, I won't go into too much of the details here on how to actually send a relay to a network. It's a little bit too protocol specific and it can change whenever you go uh, over to Shannon. But my point being is that uh, the gateway server does all this for you and a lot more. And so kind of going into the enhancements that uh, the gateway server also does is that it provides a simple http endpoint that you can use to send a request it does a lot of session management under the hood for you as well such as like grabbing a session from a full node it does quality of service checks it provides you uh metrics prometheus metrics and as well a, a endpoint for you to see the latency of your request and it has a lot of optimizations to reduce the cpu loads that it takes to run the gateway server and as well, uh, scale to millions and billions of requests at a single time. And so we're gonna go through each one of these, one through six, and talk a little bit more deeper in depth on you know, how it works. 
Uh, the first one is a little bit simple. Uh, this is once you spin up the gateway server, there's an endpoint slash relay and you provide the chain ID. From there, uh, once you provide the chain ID with your payload, immediately you're connected to uh, the pocket uh, network and you will receive a request, uh, sorry, a response from one of the node operators. And this effectively provides you the simple endpoint that you would normally get from Infera and as well be able to tap into a lot of other pro uh, blockchains that the protocol supports. But the benefit here, in my opinion, is that you don't have to spend that much compute resources or storage resources to be able to leverage the gateway server because you're effectively delegating that over to Pocket Network's node operators. So yeah, simple endpoint to tap into Pocket Network with a simple Docker Compose file. Uh, so whenever you send a relay to the network, um, there's a lot of things that are actually happening under the hood whenever you use the gateway server. One of those things is called session management. Uh, inside the code base, we call it a session registry. And what it does is that it's responsible for grabbing all the sessions within the network uh, for each app stake and chain that you're staked into. So behind the scenes, what it would do, it was pull a full node or what we call a dispatcher and retrieve all the sessions and caches them. Without a session, you can't send a relay to the network. And so what we're doing is we're pretty much just like prematurely retrieving all the sessions in hand. So that way we could send a, a, a request to the network really fast. And what this does is that instead of like whenever a user sends a request to the gateway server, we don't have to send a request to uh, the pocket node and then get back a session and then finally send an actual request to the pocket node again. Uh, basically, what we're doing is we're removing a round trip from uh, the gateway server, and that ultimately reduces the latency whenever uh, serving a request. And so, yeah, effectively, what we're basically doing is just caching sessions. And whenever we cache a session, this allows us to also do quality of service checks. And so kind of going into the node selector service, which is also another component inside the gateway server, uh, no selector service, literally what it sounds like, uh, it's responsible for determining which node is the right node to send a request to. And the way it determines which node should be sent the request is that it's constantly doing quality of service checks under the hood asynchronously. It's doing them nonstop. You know, you have all these nodes within a session for all the apps that you're staked into, all the chains that you're staked into, and under the hood, we're constantly doing quality service checks for each one of those nodes to determine if they're healthy or not. And the way that we do quality of service checks is through this idea of a check job. Uh, it's an extendable framework to create quality of service checks for nodes. Um, so, you know, the idea was that we wanted to make it so that way you can easily create your own custom checks, create your own custom ways to determine if a node is healthy or not because at the end of the day like determine if a node is healthy is going to be dependent on the gateway operator maybe they have like very strict quality of service requirements or you know uh maybe they're trying to support a chain that doesn't really support to a specific like standard um and so they want to have like a custom integration and so that's the use case of this uh, check job frameworks that you're able to extend and create more uh, quality of service uh, checks uh, within the code base. And uh, as is right now, we have two existing check jobs. One is for height checks, and the other one is for data integrity checks. Um, we we'll go over the height check. Once again, it sounds exactly the way it is. The purpose of it is to determine if a node is synced or not. Um, you know, we don't want to send a request over to a node that isn't synced, right? That would just create really bad user uh, create really bad user experience. And so what we do uh, during a height check job is that uh, effectively what we do is we retrieve all the nodes height by sending them a, a request for the height. And then what we'll do is we'll compare them to each other. Say, hey, uh, you know, what is the difference between uh, node one and node two and node three, node four? Um, and then, you know, if you are exceeding a specific tolerance, so, you know, let's just say that node one is 10 blocks uh, synced behind uh, node two, then, you know, if the block tolerance is set at 10, then uh, that node will no longer be sent requests. 
Going over to data integrity checks. Um, this is just a check that we put in place just in case there are malicious node operators. As far as we know, this check hasn't really been used that much. Uh, to be honest, Pocket Network usually only has good node operators, um, not necessarily any malicious op node operators that are trying to uh, intentionally send wrong data to the user. Um, but what this check does under the hood is that it's going to sample different nodes and determine if they're sending us a wrong block identifier. Uh, so like a block identifier can be things that you can't really guess unless you actually have the block data. So like block hash, the number of transactions inside a block, um, those are the two ones that we currently use. And so what we'll do is we'll take a healthy node. Uh, step one is we'll take a healthy node uh, get and send them a request for a random block and we'll use that as kind of like the source of truth and then we'll check like for example if they return us a block hash of 123 we'll send that same request to 10 other node operators and if they return us a different block hash then we know that you know they're, they're malicious and we'll filter out those node operators as well and ultimately you know combining these two checks what we get is that we know that uh, whenever we do send a request over to uh, the gateway server, you have nodes that are in sync and they're returning data because they're actually synced to the blockchain and they're not returning data from a different blockchain or just random data to us. Oh, why is there two of them? Do you, do you use um, to check uh, response times? Response times is also, uh, we, we, we we store the response times and so we calculate p90 latency uh for the response times as well and that's i'll go over that in just a second but there shouldn't be two of them sorry about that um kind of going more into filter checks um you know this is just kind of like you know what else can we incorporate into the gateway server in the future and, you know this is open arms for the community to also contribute to this open source project uh, number one, you know, you could take the check job framework and extend it to archival checks. You know, maybe you come up with an opinionated mechanism to query like the first 10 blocks of a node. If it returns an error, then you could punish them. Um, and another thing uh, is that right now the gateway server supports pretty much all the EVM chains that, you know, conform to the EVM spec. And we also added custom integration to Solana Pocket. Uh, near, as far as I know, is under development by Liquify. Uh, but some of these chains don't have a specification, and so they do require a little bit more special integration. But the check job framework will allow you to extend it to other chains as well. Cool. Uh, so kind of like combining this all together with a, a diagram here. Um, we could start off with, can you guys see my mouse cursor on the curiosity? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so probably starting here with the session primer. Um, this has always happened behind the scenes, whether you're receiving a request or not. Uh, the session primer, uh, the session registry is responsible for just retrieving all the sessions for all your app stakes and chains and caching them. And then it feeds it over to the node selection service. The node selection service is once again responsible for determining the a healthy node, it periodically runs check jobs uh, at a certain interval. Those are changeable with uh, by adjusting the variables. And then whenever you actually send a request over to the network, um, pretty much at that point, uh, all these things happening with the node selection service and session primer is happening asynchronously. And by the time you actually send a request over to the gateway server, uh, we already have a healthy node for you. But uh, some other cool features and enhancements of the gateway server is that we have Prometheus metrics uh, that has everything in regards to latency. How much does it take to uh, send a request? Is it going over to Altris? With an environment variable, you can also visualize the service domain that, you know, for each one of these requests. And that opens up to a lot of cool dashboards that can be created with Grafana and other observability tools. We also have a endpoint that is returned in JSON. Um, it basically 
returns all sorts of data that can be used by third party providers like PocketScan. Um, what it does is it provides data about the node, it's the specific node, and as well, uh, is the node synced? Is it healthy? The P90 latency, the last known height, all this cool stuff to really build out a rich data. And uh, I said this before, but if gateway operators adopt the gateway server, this creates now a standard for quality of service data. And then third party providers can ultimately provide data within their UX to provide rich data to node operators to help improve their quality of service. And so I know for sure Pocket Scan is currently working on integrating uh, this endpoint into their tooling and then bringing back the geo tab. Uh, I don't have an estimate on the timeline there, but uh, you know, that's kind of like the potential of this standard for quality of service data. Cool. Uh, some other optimizations that we do under the hood. And, you know, this is just, I guess, general software engineering. Um, whenever you're working at web requests at scale, you have to think about things like, you know, how, how to do connection pull in, how long to keep a connection open for, um, JSON deserialization, serialization, those things take up CPU cycles. And we use these really high scale frameworks and, you know, optimal performance uh, libraries that allow us to scale significantly. Um, those being fast HTTP is actually built by the same developer or development team. And, uh, you know, like I said before, this allowed us to run gateway server in terms of infrastructure costs, and we can scale up to billions of requests at less than a thousand dollars a month. And so, and, you know, ultimately this is inherited by the other gateway operators as well. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much the end. Um, I really meant for the questions to be asked at the end, but, you know, call to action here is that it's open source. If you're interested in spinning up a gateway, interested in improving the user experience, interested in taking up one of the existing, you know, GitHub issues, uh, please do feel free to kind of like clone up the repository. Uh, inside the README, we have uh, contribution guidelines that you can use. But yeah, love to have you guys onboarded, contributing to the uh, GitHub. Right now, there has been various contributions already from different third parties. I know Liquify, once again, is working on near implementation. Chainstack also included a PR that we merged in. Um, I think even maybe Porters or developer DAO even made a contribution. But yeah, uh, this thing is just going to keep on growing and growing. And uh, with that being said, you know, this is a good time to ask questions now. I can't see the chat though. One question. Uh, how, how are we gonna deal with kind of uh, being monotonic in terms of ensuring that we're always getting latest data? Uh, who's so asking I know you're that doing, by the uh, way? Andy, Andy, liquify. Okay. I know. I know. We're doing doing quality of service health checks on on block height, but are they granular enough to ensure that we're always hitting the highest node? Yes. Uh, so I mean, I kind of like hand waved it a little bit for you, but um, w within a certain degree, we do have certainty of determining if they're like on the highest check or not. Uh, basically, the more app stakes you have the more nodes that you will have as well to check against. And we don't do height checks. All the check jobs are not done amongst a specific session. So it's not only set within like 24 nodes. It's actually, if you have like 10 app stakes, that's actually 240 nodes that you're checking against. And so that provides a little bit more higher guarantee that you know, you're receiving the latest height. But as well, we do some advanced filtering by calculating disease score. Like, we're, we're calculating disease score to determine, like, for example, if there's like an anonymous node that returns a node height of like 4 billion, then we'll filter those out. And so, you know, these opinionated check jobs isn't going to provide 100% guarantees, right? But it, it do actually does a pretty damn good enough job to provide a good user experience.
Anybody else have any other questions? Feel free to drop them in chat too. I have a couple questions myself. Uh, question number one with regard to more specifically. A few days ago, I posted on Discord asking why the update, why the gateway server didn't use Pocket Go, which abstract complexities and details like signing and sending a relay. And I understand there's different ways to go about it, but was hoping you could shed a bit more light about the history and approach that led to this. Uh, yeah, this I, I could go, yeah, I could go into kind mm -hmm. of like um, a lot more historical information on the, the way we went about it. Um, I think it was a little bit of knowledge like knowledge sharing as well right um while it's nice for hmm, what's the best way to frame this pocket go handles a lot of the protocol integration for you already in regards to signing like you mentioned in hashing however it's also built to be a general purpose library and so it has a lot more functions than what we needed to um, send a relay um, because it has things, for example, submitting a transaction to the network as well for all sorts of different transaction messages. But another reason why, and it, it ultimately goes down to kind of like the underlying implementation, is that it uses the default HTTP client um, standard standard library inside GoLang, and you know there's nothing necessarily wrong with it, but it does require a lot of fine tuning as well to really serve a lot of requests a second. For example, you have to tune, like how many connections do you want to keep open uh, within the HTTP client and a lot of other things that, you know, fast HTTP client does for you. Um, and so, you know, it was a little bit of assumption that probably whenever Pocket Go was built, um, the defaults wasn't enough for us and as well, you know, at the same time, I think it was good for us to also provide our own Pocket Go client, so that way um, there's multiple implementations, and uh, we knew exactly how the Pocket protocol actually worked under the hood and solidified that as well. Cool, appreciate that. Um, and I think that actually, so, uh, thank you for the answer, kind of what I was looking for. And I think this leads me well into my next question, where as we build towards Canon, where a lot of these details that you're talking about um, are going to be different. For example, things like signing relays, uh, the approach and logic there is different for scalability reasons. But then there's going to be a lot of overlap on things like session management, for example. Right. So some things are the same, some things are different. What would you need for a simpler integration with Canon test nets mm -hmm. in the shorter term? Mm -hmm. And before you answer that, is I think there's an SDK, right? Which kind of handles uh, state, handles network connections, handles uh, all of those components. And then there's something that can be a library, which are just stateless functions that you can use for this core business logic. And the question is, what would be the path of least resistance to an integration with gateway server in the one timeline. Good question. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, the question is like, what would enable us to support Shannon faster, basically within the gate, uh, gateway server? Uh, what tooling would be best used for that? Um, you know, whenever we developed the gateway server, we actually did use Pocket Go as kind of like a reference as well to see how things worked. You know, we kind of like reverse engineered uh, the underlying implementation of Pocket Go. And while we didn't use it directly, it was still very good learning resource for us to see exactly how things worked as well. Um, and so probably the best thing to provide to us as like people that are building on top of the protocol, is just like reference implementations, even if it's not built for scale. Because um, I think that's what the gateway server ultimate goal is as well from abstracting away the complexity is, is to make it extremely performant and built for scale. And so as long as there's like, reference implementation of like you know how to sign a relay how to grab a session even if we don't use it directly i know that a lot of the other 
parts of the community definitely would use the SDK. Um, but we would still ultimately use it as well, right? Maybe mm -hmm. not directly, but you know, kind of digging into it, I think a SDK would be extremely useful, especially if that SDK had like examples inside its readme on how to send a relay. Yeah, uh, to summarize that, I think from the protocol perspective, uh, a SDK would be the best thing for us. Awesome. Uh, thank you for the answer. And other protocol, I know there's a handful of protocol team members on the call. Uh, so I think this will give us some good direction in terms of prioritization as well. I've, you know, ironically, I've thought about in, implement, like, how can I almost like a adapter pattern, like providing an adapter pattern where, you know, you have like this whole relay implementation within the gateway server, right? Like if I create like an adapter pattern, whether it's like adapting to V1, sorry, uh, Morse or Shannon, but I didn't want to invest too much time into creating an adapter pattern, knowing that, you know, ultimately there will be no need for adapter pattern whenever uh, Shannon gets released. And so instead of going for like adapter pattern, uh, likely what we'll do is once Shannon is available, the SDKs are available, we'll have a separate branch for Shannon and they will remove all like the legacy code of uh, Morse and just directly natively implement uh, Shannon without any abstraction. Cool. Any? Did anyone learn anything from this? Did it, was this useful for running a gateway? Yeah, I have one. If you have time. Oh. Or hey, you attend these calls, man. Nice. <laughs> Sometimes uh, about the replication of the service because I, I saw uh, I, I hear all your your explanation, but look like uh, the process is uh, calling mm -hmm. the notes to to get the information also to get the session. But what if I replicate the the gateway server multiple times? I will be calling two, three, or n times. Uh, for the same, or is yeah. something in between that you will mm -hmm. use as a cache layer? Yeah. So currently, right now, yes, everything is stored locally, meaning that it's local to the process. And to be honest, this was intentional design, and I'll go into the reasons why it's intentional design, but as well how we could also improve it. Um, so it's intentional, right? Because people will place these gateway servers in multiple geographic regions, and so. You know, it kind of gets into this weird situation where, because it's currently right now, Morse is heavily tied to geographic regions, right? Node operators are placing geographic nodes everywhere using GeoMesh. And so, you know, depending on where you place the gateway server, mm -hmm. the data, the quality of service data that you're getting is going to be different. And so that's why we decided to keep it local into the gateway server. The trade off there is that for each you know, region that you deploy the gateway server, you spend, for example, three gateway servers in a single region, then yeah, you're, you're, you're not sharing that quality of service data per region. But, you know, we, we're, we're, we're only priming the, the nodes periodically. And so it's not a lot of relays per mm -hmm. session that we're sending over, right? It's like one or two, mm -hmm. um, there's a cooldown period. And so it's not really, uh, issue right now. However, if we do start to send a lot of relays to the network just for quality of service checks, then I think a future improvement that we can do is that we can start to share that that quality of service data uh, per region. So you know maybe a future improvement is that you have like a Redis cache that contains the quality of service data, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know per gateway server you can configure which Redis instance that you pull it from, and they can share it. Yeah. So um, uh, and about the the RPC one, the one you will use for forget the the session itself, that I believe are not the network nodes, are just some nodes you you place for it. Um, um, what about the check for those? Do do you are running some kind of check for for the hey to know if your dispatches are out of sync or something like that? Uh, currently, no. I think, yeah, currently no, 
there is no like health check to determine if the dispatcher is live. I almost wonder if it should be the responsibility of the gateway server to determine if the dispatcher is live because uh, to be honest, what you can do is probably use something like HA proxy and have a low balanced um, uh, backend with multiple uh, pocket full nodes and implement the HA proxy check and that should be sufficient. Um, and so, I mean, I'm not opposed to it. It's just a matter of like, do we want to go that route and provide more responsibility for the gateway server or not? Right now, I kind of encourage people to kind of load balance to their load balance uh, pocket nodes, if anything. Uh, directly answer your question right now, no, no health checks. It just kind of assumes that you have a healthy dispatcher. Okay. Yeah, I also think it's worth uh, mentioning that um, you wish Shannon, uh, you know, with how dispatching works and uh, everything like that. Um, yeah, there there might be slightly different uh, solutions. So we also don't want to commit too heavily on features that are more s specific that might, uh, you know, have a very short shelf life versus, um, you know, uh, kind of being fa uh, uh, Shannon focused. Uh, so anyway, so that's just something to uh, keep in mind when we're thinking about features for Gateway Server. Cool. Yeah, good points. Um, I do want to probably take less than like two minutes, but as well give an update on Nodi's Gateway. Um, so like independent of the Gateway Server, if you don't mind. It'd be very short. It does deal with Pocket, and it's a pretty cool darn field, uh, feature as well. And this might... Uh, help other gateway operators think about how they might kind of like intertwine their hybrid solutions and encourage different types of mm, ways to do business on top of Pocket. And so uh, let me just share my screen real quick. Uh, this is going to be launched at the end of the week. So probably by, by latest tomorrow. Oh no, the stream ended. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right, cool. Um, so whenever you create an endpoint on our platform, uh, what we now have is a toggle that says route to pocket. And uh, what this ultimately allows Nodi to do is you know, expand our supported blockchains, because now what we can do is basically for a chains that we don't support centralized, we can just send it directly to pocket using the gateway server. And so, like, theoretically, let's just say that we don't support Kava Archivo inside our centralized fleet. Um, users can still create an endpoint, and by default, it's already enabled to route to Pocket. And uh, we will do this for, we could do this, for example, for Solana as well. But let's just say that there was a chain that we already support in our centralized services as well. Oops. Um, like, for example, Ethereum, we have a centralized node, but as well, the user has the option to uh, route the Ethereum traffic that they created over straight to pocket by enabling this toggle. And so it's a hybrid solution where, like, for example, we still want their business if, you know, we don't support that blockchain node and pocket enables us to do that. And then uh, in use cases where uh, we already support the node centrally, maybe they want the benefits of pocket network or they want to support pocket network, whatever reason, then they as well have the option to route over to pocket and this is hitting live uh, end of week and that's the update for nodes gateway as well yeah hope that's useful for other gateway operators if they run centralized nodes mm -hmm. different ways you could probably design it but yeah thanks blade um really appreciate the the presentation and and the thoroughness of it um really Really happy with the content. I'm excited to um, get that out for future people to be able to use as well. Um, we are a little bit over time, but uh, I wanted to pass it to Shane to just give us a, a couple of thoughts and wrap wrap everything up here. Cool. Yeah. Just want to thank everyone for presenting. Um, really excited uh, with where uh, gateways are are going. Um, you know what what exactly gateways are. Uh, has been uh, it, and where they fit into the pocket network has been uh, a multi-year um, journey, and it's really cool to see where things are going now. Uh, I want to thank all the gateways that uh, have 
presented uh, what they're building. Um, thank them for all the hard work and uh, uh, the care and attention that, that they put into uh, what they're building. Um, I also want to point out that uh, this, uh, everyone here has actually had a part in all the software being built. Um, all the software that uh, has been shown here today is actually through uh, through Dow funds, uh, which is really cool to see um, the effects of uh, how the Dow funds can be used to uh, to literally build um, or ecosystem uh, elements uh, like all the software going from gateway server uh, to allow people to uh, deploy. Uh, deploy a gateway in a super fast manner, uh, at least on, on the gateway to pocket side, it abstracts away all the complexities of dealing with pocket itself and makes it super easy to start mm -hmm. sending calls to the uh, network. And then uh, what uh, Liquify and Raid Guild is doing with um, uh, building kind of front end uh, user management systems uh, and things of that nature. So basically completing the stack to where, uh, you know, someone could take everything that they built here and uh, take gateway server and you could essentially have a package of sending, um, uh, of being able to onboard customers and uh, create a business around uh, providing um, a user interface for people to connect to the pocket network. So anyways, Really cool. Just wanted to kind of bring uh, bring all this uh, together, include everyone uh, in this. This is not a project that uh, just kind of happens uh, just on its own. Uh, it, it it involved literally the entire ecosystem to bring all this together. And, uh, you know, all this is being powered by the DAO funds. So that's the uh, importance of, of seeing what DAO funds can uh, DAO funds can do. So anyways, really excited for even what's coming up with creds um, because then it'll allow more folks to be involved in the um, uh, in decision making. But uh, it's really cool to see where where we've gotten to uh, thus far and really look forward to then Shannon being an entirely new chapter in our uh, in our uh, in our journey. So there we go. Uh, yeah, that basically concludes everything. Um, we will be, uh, I believe our next uh, builders call will be in two weeks. Uh, so uh, be sure to tune into that. Uh, ideally, again, each of these builder calls is to prevent or present information that is relevant to uh, builders and helps people figure out what they want to build in the ecosystem, how they can build in the ecosystem. Uh, and, you know, it's just hyper focused on empowering people with uh, information. So like, looking forward to seeing uh, everyone here uh, in two weeks to talk about what's next, which will have public testnet uh, going by then. So probably something dealing with uh, testnet. We'll be excited to, to see where things are at at that point. But uh, yeah, that basically concludes this meeting. So have a good one, everyone. Hey, Shane, sorry to yes. interrupt. We had one more request for just a quick update. So oh. um, I know many of you will have to go. So if you do have to drop again, thank you for, for showing up. Feel free to drop. But crypto, if you want to give your update real quick, um, I'm sure we have three minutes for you. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, we've been uh, pretty busy over in the DD camp. Um, a lot of the stuff we did for our own gateway was pretty much done from scratch. We didn't even take on Ether as a dependency for our Ethereum integrations. But what I wanted to uh, show you guys is a uh, mock-up for V1 of our website, which, you know, I actually have a, uh, a real designer working on the site now, but I, I rigged all the functionality, but I wanted to give you guys like a little glimpse into uh, what's going on in our world. So um, this is an overview of what our architecture looks like. Mm -hmm. So from one end, if you're the end, if you're a user going to our dashboard, getting API keys, um, you're going to interact directly with the Svelte-based website. But of course, if you're a developer, you're going to directly hit our reverse proxy. Mm -hmm. Now, the really cool thing about our setup is that we have stateless monoliths backing everything. So mm -hmm. all of our interactions to the gateway server and to Pocket to our database and even to our own infrastructure that we're running 
um, that's all being load balanced between these instances. Now it's it's fully Rust based and it's highly efficient. Um, but here's here's some of the interactions from the front end, which you might have the pleasure of experiencing. Mm -hmm. I'll open up the network tab so you can kind of get an idea of how fast or slow some of these requests are. Most of the variance is between two to seven milliseconds. And the cool thing about this benchmark is that on the key generation path, we're actually running multiple SQL queries. On the server side here, um, if you see on the bottom right-hand corner, um, you can see the actual time it's taking on the server for these types of actions. And, um, oh, I'll show you the actual uh, integration into the, uh, the pocket server, because that's pretty cool. Um, a lot of the magic is through type system. Um, here's some commented out code for later. But um, I have a cool enum that represents all the pocket chains mm -hmm. here. And instead of heap allocating a hash map, I kind of manually just wrote another function, so to speak. Very common in FP if you don't want um, uh, a static memory in this way. So on the actual route here, we um, <clears throat> from the path, we will take your key and, or sorry, we take your key in the middleware verify it's you, do the relevant operations. Then we send it through this relay pocket transaction method, which goes ahead, it gets the endpoint from the method I showed you earlier and then sends it off to the server. Um, it's a little up in the air as to for MVP, whether or not we'll have some of our own managed infrastructure. But um, what we do have running already is extremely quick and low latency. And so for our release, at least, that's our number one focus. We, we want to be the fastest. And we will optimize every clock cycle until that happens. But yeah. Um, we're virtually feature complete at this point for our MVP. Um, the last thing we actually have to do is on-chain payments, which I actually miraculously just got a PR, PR in for. Um, very grateful that someone did a PR for that. And um, yeah, then I'm going to hook it up. The designer is going to get his hands on the site so it doesn't look like a uh, back-end developer wrote the website. And yeah, persist the logic and uh, let the uh, CSS flow. Great, great. Th thank you, Abdul. Uh, just one question here: Do, do you use uh, the uh, the the Pocket Gateway server as a backend, or you are directly uh, going through uh, another API? Yeah. So in the background here, we do we do have the um, the Golang based gateway server here, and that's hooked up to the monolith through the um, through their JSON RPC. And um, at this level, um, there's also going to be some load balancing as well. Um, once we get to the point, at least, where we run our own infrastructure separate from Pocket, and once Pocket starts supporting these things, of course, we could run them as nodes on Shannon or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the main idea. Everything is kind of hooked together um, by this stateless Rust monolith. Okay, thanks. So how does how does your gateway uh, deal with uh, uh, kind of geo routing to you know get get requests to the closest nodes? Is are uh, it you know as part of the service you're running you know a uh, uh, geo uh, geo located um, uh, DNS or something like that routing uh, to one of to then one of the 
uh, stateless uh, gateway servers? So that's one thing we definitely plan on doing. Um, for MVP, at least, we don't expect anyone to be able to actually overrun an individual node. But if that does happen, um, we'll be able to spin up another instance through our through our um, containerization. And of course, when we spin up this instance, we'll put it in a different region. But um, I, I think that is a great idea, though. Uh, I am going to steal that. Thank you for contributing, my friends. Yeah, and and uh, these uh, uh, I, I I I forget what you call them, but stateless. Uh, you call them gateway instance or something like that. I'm, I'm, what, what did you call it again? Uh, stateless Rust gateway. Okay, yeah, the, the the stateless Rust gateway. So, is that something that uh, other people would be able to run, uh, or or is that or is that still all internal? Like you could spin up more of these uh, instances if you need them, but uh, other people aren't running these uh, these gateways, are they? Um, other people are not. Um, so okay. this is mostly a big part of our scaling strategy. So okay. as soon as one monolith starts to get overloaded, which granted is going to take uh, an extreme load, um, we'll be able to spin up another one, uh, split the load, make sure it doesn't get overwhelmed, and make sure we can keep um, all the benefits of statelessness, being, being able to um, horizontally scale at will, fully proportional to whatever we add onto our network. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all, last call for any questions. We are well over time, but um, Crypto, really appreciate you jumping in to present. Um, I will I will message you in the future instead of Kemp for any updates. That way we can make sure we're on the same page for this. I can, I can uh, give you actual space during the call. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you, thank you. Of course. All right, Shane, pass it back to you so you can close this up again. <laughs> Oh, that was a that was a great uh, uh, bonus uh, bonus update as well. So thank you, developer Dow. Super excited about that. Um, yeah, uh, basically that's uh, that that concludes everything. Um, so yeah, we're we're ready to close out. Thanks everyone. Um, yeah, I think the next community call is just next week's uh, regular uh, ecosystem call on Wednesday. So catch you all there. Thanks everyone. Thank you, everybody. Look for these to be up on YouTube in the next couple of days. Thanks a lot.